Hello, this is Dr. Gary Siskin, and I'm about to start the last part of my five-part lecture series on the uterine fibroid embolization procedure. This lecture, which is focusing on the complications of uterine fibroid embolization, is purposely short, because one of the notable things about UFE is its record of safety. Some of the statistics include a readmission rate of 2.7%, a major complication rate of 2.9%, and a hysterectomy rate due to a complication of less than 1%. Technical failures have been reported during the procedure, including an, an inability to selectively catheterize one or both uterine arteries. This can occur due to poor visualization or vasospasm or several other causes. You can have a failure to deliver the embolic agent and to reach an appropriate endpoint, potentially due to catheter-related issues or spasm as well. And finally, non-target embolization can occur uh, during this procedure. Some of the immediate complications occurring after fibroid embolization include angiographic complications and allergic and drug reactions. It's important to remember that this is an angiogram, so the complications that we can see, including hematomas or distal embolization or other arterial complications, can still occur after this procedure. The good thing is that most of these patients are in their 40s and their arteries tend to be healthy and the risk of these complications is low. Venous thromboembolic disease has also been reported after the procedure. Fortunately, this is rare and as you know, it can occur in, in patients undergoing any procedure due to prolonged bed rest. But keep in mind that case reports have been described um, with PEs leading to death after fibroid embolization. Other immediate complications include skin burns, because in obese patients, UFE can potentially lead to skin burns due to radiation exposure. Non-target embolization is another issue, as I mentioned earlier. Cases of labial necrosis and full thickness buttock necrosis have been reported and, and were presumably attributed to non-target embolization. In terms of delayed complications, persistent discharges can occur in less than 4% of patients. This may be due to a sinus formation from the necrotic fibroid into the endometrial cavity, which is seen here on this hysteroscopic image. Sexual dysfunction has been reported as well, including a temporary loss of orgasm after this procedure. There are several potential mechanisms for this. First, you can have reflux of embolic material into the internal pudendal artery and this is responsible for supplying the pudendal and genital femoral nerves. Post-inflammatory changes can cause transient nerve compression, and finally, non-target embolization can occur in the cervical vaginal branch of the uterine artery, which is why I highlighted that in my technique lecture. Fortunately, most women tolerate this well, with about half needing no operative intervention. Conservative strategies include administering drugs for pain relief, and antibiotics if there's evidence of infection, such as a fever, increased white count, or a foul odor. Unfortunately, some will require some GYN procedure to address this, including hysteroscopy, a transvaginal myomectomy, or hysterectomy. The good news is that future pregnancy is possible after fibroid expulsion, and that expulsion or disintegration of the fibroids following embolization may lead to nearly complete architectural restoration of the uterine cavity, as is shown in these images from an article by Park in 2005. Another potential delayed complication is premature amenorrhea. This was first reported by Chrisman in 2000, when the Northwestern Group reported a 14% incidence of this complication occurring after age 45. Other studies have reported that over 40% of patients after age 50 can experience premature amenorrhea. These findings were confirmed by Katsumori in 2008, who showed an almost 20% rate of permanent amenorrhea in patients greater than 44 years of age within three years of the procedure. And within six years of the procedure, that rate increased to 40%. And they also showed that in patients less than 40 years of age, there is a 0% rate of premature amenorrhea. Now, this has obvious implications for patients desiring future fertility. And of course, the risk of premature amenorrhea should be discussed with these patients. The good news is that younger patients 
have a greater capacity to recover after ovarian damage from this procedure, which is likely why the rate has been reported as zero in patients younger than 45 years of age. There are other potential delayed complications, which fortunately are all rare. Infections have been reported, and they can be acute or even delayed after fibroid embolization, with some occurring weeks to months after the procedure. They can often be attributed to arrested transcervical passage of submucosal fibroids, although pyomyoma is possible as well. And remember that delayed infections can lead to fatal complications due to sepsis. Uterine ischemia is possible as well, and when it occurs, it's likely due to a lack of anticipated collateral supply to the uterus. It's characterized by unremitting abdominal pain that doesn't follow the expected time course of post-procedure pain, and hysterectomy may be required if this occurs. Fistulas can form as well. This may include vesico-uterine fistulas, which may be due to non-target embolization to the vesicle arteries or from inflamed necrotic fibroids in contact with the posterior bladder wall. Uteroenteric fistulas have been reported as well. These may be associated with adhesions or from inflammation in the adjacent uterus. Bowel obstruction can occur. And this may be secondary to inflammatory changes in fibroids and adjacent bowel leading to adhesion formation and subsequent bowel obstruction. Bowel obstruction has also been reported in association with sloughing of a subserosal fibroid. So I think you have to remember that UFE is a safe procedure with a low risk of major complications. With the exception of transcervical expulsion and premature amenorrhea in older patients, all other complications are quite rare. It's important for interventional radiologists performing this procedure to understand the risks for significant complications and to know how to manage them when they occur. I do want to end this series of lectures with one final thought, and this is the response of the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology to this procedure. In 2000, ACOG issued their first practice bulletin, and what they said was that more research is required before fibroid embolization can be recommended as a routine treatment option. In 2004, this opinion was adjusted. What they said at that time was that UFE, when performed by experienced physicians and appropriate candidates, appears to provide short-term reduction in the uterine and fibroid size, as well as short-term improvement in menstrual bleeding and other fibroid-related symptoms. Finally, in 2008, and reaffirmed in 2014, ACOG changed their position again. And what they said is that based on long and short-term outcomes, UAE is a safe and effective option for appropriately selected women who wish to retain their uterus. And this was given a level A recommendation. Women who wish to undergo embolization should have a thorough evaluation with an OBGYN to help facilitate optimal collaboration with the interventional radiologist and to ensure the appropriateness of therapy, taking into account the reproductive, of, the reproductive wishes of the patient. So in conclusion, IR has done an excellent job at defining and proving the role of UFE in the treatment of uterine fibroids. And the procedure has shown itself to be a safe and effective option for most women with symptomatic uterine fibroids. Transcervical fibroid expulsion is another potential delayed complication. Symptoms of this include lower abdominal cramping or pain, infection, continuous bleeding, vaginal discharge, and passage of tissue fragments. It has not been uncommon for patients of mine to let me know that they have passed tissue fragments as they recover from this procedure.